Welcome everyone and good morning or good afternoon, wherever this webinar finds you. My name is Monty Latchley. I work for Insum in the area of business development. And with me today is my good friend and member of the Insum family, Michelle Scamini. Hello, Michelle. Hi, Monty. It's Tuesday, uh, September 21st. And thank you for spending a piece of your afternoon with us. This webinar is sponsored by Insum. If you're doing anything at all with Apex and you need a lifeline, reach out to us. We offer everything from coaching and mentoring all the way through to turnkey project management and development. We're laser focused on Apex and we have been since 2004. Michelle, we usually partner with each other on what's called the Insum Insider. Uh, we've been in dry dock for a, for a bit now as we prepare for season three and we'll have some exciting announcements uh, coming out in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, with each... Oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> with each release of Application Express, uh, the, tool, the tool does more and more for us. I mean, it's already a, a feature-rich platform, but I think what it does is it places more and more in, importance and more and more emphasis on the things that the developer remains responsible for. Yeah. And that is primarily your SQL and, and your PL SQL used by the application. Yeah. And that's precisely what we're going to address here in today's webinar, Michelle. Absolutely. So we have with us today the authority on PL SQL. We read his books, we watch his videos. I'm talking about Insom's own Stephen Feuerstein, who joined us earlier this year. Um, one of Stephen's main tasks since joining us has been to work with our consultants to help them level up their code. Um, their codes definitely improved and they've really been raving about it. So we decided we'd love for Stephen to be able to work in a similar manner with our clients, um, with others or other members of the Oracle community. So we're here today to tell you a little bit about Stephen's uh, new Next Level PL SQL program. Stephen and Insum VP and Oracle ace Anton Nielsen are actually going to take you through the program. They're going to show you exactly what it's like. We do encourage your participation. Please do use the Q&A. We'll be monitoring that throughout. There's a lot of you on the call today, so we're going to do our very best to get to all of your questions. Um, but right now, I'd like to hand it over to Stephen and Anton. And Monty, why don't you and I come back when they're done? I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> that sounds good, Michelle. All right, great. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Monty, have for that introduction. A, have a good uh, hello, session, everybody. you guys. Thanks. So I'm Stephen Feuerstein, and this is Anton. Anton, say say hello. Oh, right, that's me. Um, next level PL SQL. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Anton Nielsen, sorry. <laughs> okay, as you can tell, this is gonna be a fairly informal session. So what I wanna do is tell you what we're gonna do for the next 45 minutes or so and, uh, and invite your uh, involvement all the way through. So next level PL SQL, in fact, um, Michelle, if you could share that, that page from the PowerPoint. Uh, so when I joined Insum in February of 2021, I made a big decision, it was an amazingly big career change in that I switched to part-time. So I'm no longer a full-time software person. And instead what I do is combine my software time or complement my software time with a lot of time outdoors spent healing the planet in any way I can, which is largely removing invasives to help native ecosystems thrive. And I encourage you in this time of climate crisis to figure out how you can also spend whatever time is available to you to directly help heal our planet. So I've got a limited amount of time left for PL SQL and some and so forth. So we've constructed the next level PL SQL program, both for internal use and now for external use to really make the most use of my time and also your time. So the idea is really quite simple. You send me code. You send me a bunch of files of packages. You send me some exports of your applications that have a bunch of code in them. I take that code and I read through it. And notice what I didn't say was send me all your table definitions and I'll recreate your environment. No, I don't wanna know about your table definitions. All I wanna do is look at your code. So I sweep through your code pretty quickly because I've been doing this for a long time and I fill it up with comments. Then when I'm done looking through that code and thinking about it a little bit, then I invite you and your team to join me and we go through the comments and I talk about what I found in your code, ideas I have for changing it, improving it and so on. We have a conversation. Sometimes I get corrections from the team on something I wasn't aware of and the way the code was written. But in general, we work together to understand the code better and understand where you can take that code. And then I deliver a report at the end that with high level viewpoints on how I think you can improve. Okay, you can stop sharing that screen. Um, so Anton, 
has agreed to participate with me in this session. We're going to do a real lot next level PL SQL session in that Anton sent me a package. I was going to say, Anton, why don't you tell people about the utility? But no, I don't care about your utility. I just care about your code. I went through and the code. I want, to jump, I want to interrupt and just say, Stephen and I have been having this relationship. Uh, I, actually, even before you joined Insum a, a couple of times, but but since he's been in Insum. So I have a feeling of what it's like. Um, and I have to say, I'm really amazed, Stephen, at how I can just send you a package and you're able to read through it and provide real insight without any explanation, though I do like to think that there are some comments of, of value in my code. Nonetheless, it, it really is amazing to me. Um, and uh, and so I think it's it's really, you know, shows your experience in, in having done this many, many times. Um, but the other thing I just want to say is I would highly recommend that you not take Stephen's comments and code back and just install them in your environment because it really is about the collaboration, right? It's about this step is a key element of it that makes it efficient uh, is, is having this conversation with Stephen. That's a starting point, really a starting yeah. point or a, a step along the journey. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna look at code. So again, the idea is that uh, Anton sent me this file and all I literally did was go through it and put in little comments with the keyword SF. So I can do a search on SF and off we go. So Anton, let's take a look at your code. So uh, right. the first thing I ran into right at the top is this interesting procedure called create user. So let's take a look. You pass in the username, you pass in the source that it came from, who knows what that is. And uh, so what Anton has decided to do was a select into single row query inside a nested block. And then you, you trap the exception for no data found. Like if it's not there, what do I do? Well, what I do is I set the ID to null. And then if it's null, I insert into the table. So this is a create user as needed procedure. And, it, and what you're going to see, hopefully you'll, you'll see and what I found when I first talked to Anton about this code. It's true. We, we did talk about this code once before is that even the smallest bit of code can, you can just go exploring for a long time. So we're going to go exploring. The first thing I looked at when I saw this piece of code was you're doing a select and then an insert or possibly then doing an insert. So the question becomes, how often do you need to do which part of it? In other words, when I'm building something like a create user procedure, there are two roughly two approaches I can take. I can select and if it doesn't exist, insert, or I can insert and if it does exist, it throws a deep bound index and then I just get the ID and I return it. Or in this case, I don't return it. We'll come back to that later. So my question to you, Anton, is when this procedure is being called, is it mostly because the person already does exist or doesn't exist? What's your sense? Right. And, and this, this, is, this gets called in two scenarios. One, when somebody is actively creating a user, but more, much more likely. Um, we use um, social sign-in with the application that's associated with this. So what probably is happening is that the that the user is just logging in and we're checking to see do we have a record from so probably 99% of the time this gets called and nothing happens so okay i'd say it, the user is not likely to get created when this is called so my takeaway then is that anton followed the proper flow in that if it's mostly going to be finding a row cool then you want to do the select first and you do the insert only as needed if the cases the opposite that you're constantly registering lots and lots of users and and I don't know they never use the system so <laughs> you don't often have to query them back out then you probably want to flip it around and the point here to take away is it's not just the code now remember I said you're not going to send me tables I'm not going to learn about your data model obviously you need to know your data model and your data so when you write code like this it's a really good question to ask yourself what's going to be happening for the most part what does my data look like that's going to come up later when we look at a select count star. I think there's a count star in here. Yeah, so, I think there's, and I'll say this is the rare scenario where I did it the right way. <laughs> yeah, now you did it the right way, but an interesting question is, is this the best way to do it? So one of the problems with, with the select into is that it raises an exception when you don't find a row. Now we could probably spend oh, the whole rest of this next, next level PL SQL session just talking about no data found, but we're not going to do that. But the, the interesting thing is that no data found is a special kind of exception in that it's not really usually an error, it's a data condition. And in fact, Oracle treats it differently. So for example, if I call a user defined function in SQL and that user defined function allows a no data found exception to propagate out, 
The SQL statement says, oh, I'll just treat that as a null. Literally, it's not an error as far as SQL is concerned. So here's the thing. You're, you're taking advantage of the fact that select into will raise an exception, but exceptions are relatively slow. So an alternative approach would be to use an explicit cursor. And I think I actually have a recoding that way. Let's see, do we have it over here? So here's another approach you could take in which I have, a, I have a, an explicit cursor. I open and fetch from the cursor. If I didn't find anything, then I insert and otherwise I do nothing. And the, the advantage here is that we have the same order. We'd select first, then we insert if necessary, but we don't have the slowdown of the exception. Now, in a lot of cases, that exception overhead is not gonna be an issue for you. But part of the process of next level PL SQL is reminding you of some of these kinds of ideas. So that in the future, when you start to write code like this, you can ask yourself, wow, if it's gonna mostly fail, maybe I don't wanna use a select into. Maybe I wanna use an explicit cursor and then have that branching. Let's see, what else? Just from this one little procedure. Now, let's take a look at how it's used. Here's the call. I think it's the only one. Yes. So it's only used once within this. Oh, this is awful. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do we, do we have to show this? We have to show the code that you gave me, Anton. I'm sorry. But, but I, I'm sure a lot of you know Anton. I've known Anton for all. Anton is a really sharp developer. And one of the reasons that inside Insum, Anton and I started by looking at his code is that one of the very important messages to send throughout your entire team is that even the best people in your organization can write <clears throat> bad code. Yeah, yeah. This code is that should point. be optimized. And, it, and in fact, if you do code reviews internally, make sure that the person who's the best developer goes first and make sure that their code has some issues. And then the junior developers or the not super expert senior developers feel like, oh, okay, it's okay. It's okay to have bad code or code that could be improved. It's not bad. But take a look. So I create the user or not as the case may be. And he was saying it's, I think he, I think you were saying it's bad because you've got multiple calls to V to get the app user. At least you do it once. Well, I'm actually call, I'm saying the that I in both places, create the but. user. I, it's the create the user and then select the user right after. That's just like really right. nasty, right? Um, yeah, that because that, that, that create user could be get or create user and it could just return the ID, right? So let's go back up to the top. So we have, so it's, and again, this is a common pattern that you'll see. We have a procedure create user. Now what's nice about this is that if it creates the user, you don't pass the ID back. And that's good because a lot of times you don't need the ID, but what if I need the ID? So probably what you'd want to end up with is something that looks like this in the end. We're not gonna obviously write all this code but I would have multiple overloadings and it would be PID out or whatever the type is. This would be the baseline implementation. This would exist on top of it and it would hide the ID, but also I think we'd even want a third one. What do you think? I would want a third one, which is user ID four. Right. And then have the same parameters as this. Sure. And that would, if they don't find it, I assume that this one now um, uh, which raises an error or something of that nature, right? Well, it depends. You can have a return null, and that's an indication that, that it didn't sure. find one. Depending on how you want to approach it. You don't right? always return null to indicate not found, but it's a usually it's a good one. So yes. this one simple little procedure turns into three different, not three overloadings, two overloadings in one similar thing. But then we can have this user ID. Let's find our create user. And then this would become our user ID. Boom. Right. I think in that case, um, in that case, we want to use the create user um, that has the out variable because that, in this case, we want the the one that you know. That's right. So this function would call this create user and simply return that value. Right. This would create would call this create user and just swallow up the value. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, so that right away is, uh, you know, something that, that um, despite knowing this uh, is, is a huge improvement to the code. Um, just so you, you avoid that extra select statement, you would use a, uh, you know, a select and then a returning clause. I think most folks on the call probably know about a returning clause, but we'd be able to make a use of a returning clause in our, in our insert. Insert returning, right. Yeah, insert. So if we wanted right here, we'd say insert returning and then uh, ID into LID, right? right? Definitely. One other thing, just a little point. 
uh, there would be a, there might be a tendency to say, well, these all are based on the same code. They should all have the same name, one name, create user, and then you don't have to remember different names. I think there's a value to that, but I don't like create user as a function name. I think that function names should say, this is the thing I'm returning and not this, this is, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm returning. So. You know, Stephen, I, one thing that I often do that, and this is sort of a personal preference. If, if the, if the procedure is likely to do an insert and, and I don't want it to be a prog, uh, an autonomous transaction, a pragma, mm -hmm. um, I want it to be a procedure with an out variable because when you make it a function, it lends towards using it directly within SQL. Um, and you, if you're doing any kind of inserts or updates or deletes, you can't do it within the SQL statement. So I tend to make that a procedure not a function, but that's just a personal a personal kind of preference. Um, the, the, the challenge I find is if you make it a function and somebody uses it, it's going to work and work and work until it doesn't work. Um, uh, so, so just something there that I probably would let um, make 29 only um, return a user ID if, it, if they exist and not do the insert unless I made it a pragma with an autonomous transaction, right? So these really, are- Really, really good point, yeah. And create user, so for those who don't know, pragma, I should have some shortcuts here. Fortunately, I've been typing this stuff for a long time. So if you add the pragma autonomous transaction, and then this would be an insert, and then you'd have to commit. But the point is that this commit will only affect this insert. It will not affect any other outstanding changes in your application. Uh, so for example, when you're logging errors, that's when you almost always want to have an autonomous transaction procedure so you can log the error and, and then roll back your application transaction without you losing your log error. Um, so yes, that, so this would be, and, and I think actually a create user procedure might be a good candidate generally for autonomous transaction because you're creating the user. You know, right. the chances are you're not gonna back that out even if something later goes wrong. Um, yeah, you might even have a parameter like, you know, um, create if missing. Right, there you go, yeah. Now, if it's a Boolean, you can't call it in SQL, you can have an overloading for strings. <laughs> okay, let's move on because we've decided to limit the session to 40 minutes. And like I said, we could, and we did spend a lot of time just in that one piece of code. Hopefully people liked it. Let's search for my name, my initials. Steven, do you mind if I actually interrupt you with a few questions and comments have come in? <laughs> um, yep. So we have uh, Daljit who comments, so is creating the user within the function okay? Shouldn't the function have no side effect? So that so was just what that's we kind of what, yeah. 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 Okay. So, so functions with side effects like that, and any function that has SQL in it, as a side effect, whether or not you're doing DML, even non-query DML, a select statement is a side effect, but it's something you want to do very carefully and you want to analyze how that code's being used for sure. So that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Angel says, what about using merge on the when not matched to do the insert? Do you think that might be better? So, the, so, so I've seen examples, of, I was working with some code that looked just like that. It was a merge that only had an insert and no update. And my concern about that, for, I'm not, I, my concern about that as a merge is, is an upsert. If you, if you do the, you do an insert or an update. So it's weird to me to have a merge that only has one branch that's active. It could be confusing to people. I really like to write code that people look at and then they say, oh, that makes perfect sense. Not what? I've never seen a merge statement like that before. What's going on? Other than that, I think it's a, it's a, it's a keen idea to look at. Yeah, the only, the only other reason is I, I don't think I'm, well, I'm, I'm going to say I don't think, but I don't, I know you cannot do a returning clause with a merge statement. So, um, and right. I really, the rewrite of this, it, it should have the returning clause under, you know, we should be able to do that. Um, and so th that's the reason I wouldn't do a merge on this. Yeah. So um, the returning clause, I have to say is, I don't know what when it was introduced, but it, it's huge. I, I think it's something that we all could do a better job making use of. So. And I think I have a Florida tip on returning. So do check that out or just search search for the returning clause. Okay. And, yet, and yet I didn't use it. <laughs> In that piece of code, right. Well, you didn't, you weren't oriented towards returning an ID, right? And then you used it later and you needed the ID and yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, now, so a common pattern that I look for in code is a pattern, repeated code. And we're gonna see a really fantastic example of lots of repetition in code soon. But here's one where, again, so I sweep through and I just look for things and I what, see what strikes my mind. 
So here's user is read only, yes, no. I really like, by the way, the suffix yes, no to indicate it's returning a wire and it's good for SQL, love that. Um, and then I found that there was another one, I think right after it, that's the, that's the one on top of it for Booleans, that's great. And then there is, let me search it. And then there's user is authorized, yes, no. And it was a lot of the same code. We don't have time to go into all the details of it, but I believe there's an opportunity here where you can literally make them one program and have a parameter that differentiates between them. I'm sure you're right, absolutely. Um, because they, they're essentially the same code, they just got some very minor distinction. So um, hey, and no, even yeah. if I wanted to have, even if I wanted to have two definitions of uh, two um, function definitions, um, I could have them uh, call a singular other one. Yeah, right. That's right. You might want to have separate names instead of parameters to differentiate behavior. Right. That's that's probably more usable. Now, mm -hmm. here's a procedure that does use an autonomous transaction, does an insert, does a commit. All of that's good. But in general, when you've got a, an autonomous transaction pragma, you really need an exception handler because if it comes out unhandled, you're going to get a nasty error. Not only will it do a full rollback, but you'll get an error that you didn't close the, the autonomous transaction properly. So you pretty much should always have a handler for autonomous transactions. Good. Cruising on through. Yeah. That doesn't show up in any kind of warning, does it? I don't think so. I don't um, think so, no. I don't think there's a, a warning on that. And by warning, Anton's return, referring to compile time warnings that you can automatically ask the PLSQL compiler to give you warnings about the quality of your code. I'll come back to that when we look at the almost last line of code in the package. Uh, so here's another common pattern that I, that I look for, which is multiple returns in a function. So my vision of a function is that it's a funnel of code that funnels down to one little line at the very end of the executable section. And it says, return. Return. Well, the one return. <laughs> now, the one reason, the biggest reason I think to write code like that, so there's just one return at the end, is that you avoid a truly embarrassing runtime error, which was function does not return value. I got to say, that's embarrassing. Not only is it embarrassing to write a piece of code that could result in that error, but what's embarrassing is to, is to when the user hits errors like that to say, you didn't even test this code, did you, Stephen? Like, I didn't. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so we've got, we're going to do a select. If no data found, I'm going to do a register. Here's another one of those, basically no existence to an insert. And then I return. If this is no, then I return. Else this, you can see returns all over the place. Now, so again, what I think you want to do is structure your function so there's that single return at the end uh, and compile time warnings will warn you if in a program like this, there's a, there's a possibility that there's a logical branch out without a return. Oracle will actually automatically identify that and notify you, which is nice. I haven't tried it on this. I can't try it because I don't have all the, the code base, but you should compile this package with compile time warnings and see if you get any of those. And Stephen, you and I have had this conversation before. Um, just, I think it's worthwhile. Uh, I have an init file that whenever I make a connection, it turns on PL SQL uh, compile time warnings, but you showed me that I didn't need it to put it in the init file. There's actually a setting in the preferences. Um, I think that, if you learn nothing else from today's session, if I, it's this right here, go here and turn on your, um, your PL SQL warnings so that you can get uh, compiler warnings for your connections. Um, so if you're in SQL developer, you can search for the compile page. You can turn them all on. You could say, well, I don't want to turn them all on. I want to turn on performance warnings and any severe warnings I want to treat as an error and your code will not compile. If, if the PL SQL compilers thinks you've got a severe issue with your code, though it is compilable. Yes. And you can also create a standard, you know, global install script that will automatically turn things on for you in addition to that. Okay. Keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Here's the count star. Okay. So take a look at the sequence. Select count star if count is greater than zero. Now, this is answering one very specific question. How many rows do I have? But that's not what this question is. This question is, do I have at least one? A very common anti-pattern. And first of all, it may not matter. So if this query is very efficient, if it returns one or two or three rows or zero, no big deal. But if you have a, a, a query that might return a lot of rows and it might take some effort to produce that value, then this is not an efficient way to answer this question. You could do an exists. You could say if, it, if it's in, you could even, I suppose, do an approximate count. Uh, I have not used the approximate functions yet. 
but there's a there's a variation of count that gives you the approximate count. So it might be so, off by a <clears throat> So Stephen, this falls into a category of if we could give one one good or best solution that people can just resolve resolve to, um, what would it be? And I one that I use is um, and row num equal one mm -hmm. on here. Um, and I do that, and I didn't obviously here, uh, but but it's often my common uh, or row num less than two is because it's really obvious what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. and, and my experience has been that the optimizer does a great job with this. Mm -hmm. um, but do you, do you agree that this is a, a, a if, if, we're, if we're just going to say, instead of saying there's 10 ways to do it better than I did it, here's one that's quite satisfactory. I'd be if I was more of a SQL pro, I'd be I'd be happy to endorse it. If Connor or Chris Saxon, Connor McDonald or Chris Saxon of Ask Tom were here, I would mm -hmm. definitely follow whatever they said, and I think they would be pretty content with this. The yeah. only question I would have about it is not the performance, but the obscurity of it. Um, I suppose if you're doing Oracle database, you should know about Ronum and what this means, and you should be aware that, for example, Ronum can also introduce lots of problems. It can get it can end up changing the results that you're expecting. So it's, that's my only worry here. Generally speaking, what I'd actually say is I would have a function. I would just replace this with a function, which you know does uh, at least one x for whatever the parameter is, and hide the details entirely. And then you can make it row num, you can make it exist, you can make it in whatever, but it's hidden away. And you would put that as a, a sub function of this procedure. Yeah, Unless I can make it in other places, obviously. Okay. Right, I can make it a nested function here. So I can create, in case you folks didn't know it, I can create a nested function right inside another function. But then I can only call it inside here. If I think it could be more useful other places, I move it up to the package spec. Okay. Um, and that's something that I've actually taken just in the short time that you've been at Insum is I use a lot more um, both nested functions or, or just um, uh, functions that are private to the package body um, myself. Um, mm -hmm. Great. And nested subprograms to me are one of the most lovely features of PL SQL. It allows you to write really concise, readable, maintainable code, especially for your big nasty programs. Yeah. And okay. So just keeping a move through my comments, it's almost 1130 already. Uh, so exception, when anything goes wrong, just return no. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But this really caught my attention. So my suggestion would be. If you need to write a comment like that, the question would be, why aren't you logging an error? You might not re-raise the error. There might be a good reason to hide the fact that an error occurred. But if you've got a condition that you don't think should ever occur, log the error. Definitely, definitely a good point. <laughs> we already covered that. I, I noticed that this procedure had a commit in it but it doesn't have an, AT, an autonomous transaction pragma. So in general, a lot of PL SQL code, well, I'd say for the most part, it should be pretty rare that you see a commit or a rollback explicitly in your code. Generally speaking, users are determining the transaction, like they're clicking submit, that's gonna result in a commit through Apex. There's not a lot of committing going on in backend code. I'm sure there's a good reason for this, but just remember that if you put a commit in your code, it's gonna commit everything in the session. So you might want to think about making those autonomous transaction pragmas. Well, and absolutely, and I'm um, uh, I, I'm surprised to see the commit here without a comment, um, whether it be without my comment. Yeah, no, without yeah, your comment is there, but um, but mine's not. Um, and so I completely agree that I I I consider it a bug that 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 that's there without a comment. If there's a comment there explaining why it's there, um, mm -hmm. it makes sense to me, but. To just have that random commit sitting out there like that, in my mind, that's a bug. All right. Well, now we come to one of my favorite comments in anybody's code, which is use a case expression. I love case expressions, and probably I overdo it sometimes. But in general, if you see code like this, if the count's greater than zero, based on a count star, uh, then set it to this value. Otherwise, set it to that value. Really seriously, it should just look like this. So when the count, check the count, when it's zero, return no, else why? It's much more concise. It puts the, and in, in this particular case, I think it's a really big aid to readability because 
it tells you what you're doing. You're assigning a value to the variable as opposed to, I have to look inside the, the if statement to find out what I'm doing. Now, obviously this one's very simple. doesn't matter that much, but another, and I think we've got another one coming that's much more complex and it's even hard to find the duplication to apply the case to, but look for opportunities to use case expression. And, it, and again, the, I think I've got an example coming where we'll actually use it to avoid a lot of redundant code because the big thing about a case expression versus an if statement or even a case statement is you can embed it inside another statement. Let's see, let's see if we come back to that in a moment. Got that. Okay, now here's some SQL. Why not do the update and put the select in the set clause, right? So it wasn't clear to me why you were selecting something to get this value and then using it here. You could have just put this whole thing in here. I think. Without a doubt. Yeah. And then it becomes a single statement. Um, single statement. Probably if, um, if this is really being, uh, you know, good, you probably could relate write this as a single SQL statement. Right. And There's get the, away from the loop. whole loop. But, um, uh, but certainly you can absolutely in the, in the update, instead of having two statements um, with a local variable, just put the, the update right in there. I suppose just looking at it, you've got the, when no data found, um, then null, but that would work anyway. Um, right, if you update and it doesn't find any rows, it doesn't right. do anything, you don't have to have the exception, right. You get rid of the uh, exception, exception as well, yeah. But you made a good point. I drilled I drilled into this when really the bigger question is why is it, why are we doing a loop? Yeah. VML and That's line 428, right, yeah. So whenever you, this is like probably the number one anti-pattern in terms of performance, that you have row by row processing. Now this is actually, fetching 100 rows at a time with an optimized cursor for loop, but you're doing the updates on a row by row basis. Whenever you see code like this, you should ask yourself, first of all, can I do it in straight SQL? And it looks like there's a chance you could. We don't know, you know, at a glance, you don't know for sure. But if you can make it pure SQL, that's almost always better. There are some caveats to that, but almost always better. Um, and then the second thing would be, we'll change this into a for all statement in which I can do all the updates in one context switch. So every time, you see a select statement inside a PL SQL block of code. This is gonna be a context switch. So the PL SQL engine will hit the statement. It'll get all the stuff it needs to prepare it, like all these values. It will pass it to the SQL engine. It will run the SQL statement there, pass information back to the PL SQL engine. And those back and forths can be very costly performance wise. So look for these DML inside your for loops. See if you can make it pure SQL. If not, well, if not, ask yourself, is it an issue? I mean, if, if you don't have a performance issue, you don't have to go through a rewrite. But if you ever are told by your users, oh, this is taking 10 minutes, it really needs to be faster. And you can find in that procedure, one of these, bless your lucky day. Because it's right. very hard to take a program that's running in 10 minutes, bring it down to a minute or 10 seconds, unless you can find some enormous, big, fat, hanging fruit. And that's what this sort of thing constitutes. And, and that's something that uh, I know we've talked about in the past is that that for to, to rewrite this as a bulk for all, the number of lines of code just about triples, <clears throat> right? And so the question becomes, when is it, when is it valuable enough to do that, right? right. And, and I guess I'm going to ask you again, you just said it, but I'm going to ask you sort of to repeat, when would it be valuable enough to, to rewrite this? So I would say that First of all, Oracle in their documentation says that you can expect to see benefits from bulk processing, whether it's bulk collector for all, at 100 rows or more. That's, pretty, that's a very low threshold. On the other hand, the amount of benefits you're going to see is going to be pretty small. So I would say, first of all, that using bulk collect, using for all proactively in your code is a good idea. So if I'm writing a new application and I run into the need to do this kind of looping updates or DML, I would ask myself, first of all, what kind of data volumes am I looking at? Not only today, but let's say five years from now. And if the expectation is that you're going to see a fair amount of data, then right from the start, you should go with the bulk option. It is more complex, no question about it, but it's worth it. If you're looking at one of these situations, you're thinking, yeah, but I mean, I've got 100 rows, maybe a couple hundred rows or 50 rows. Leave it with a cursor for loop. It's very simple, clean, readable code. I mean, the trade-off to go from a cursor for loop to bulk, it's a painful price to pay. It, it, it is from a coding perspective and, and yeah. it, it simply introduces more lines of code, which is more opportunity for bugs. Um, but I think that's a good, uh, a good threshold is 
um, if it's if you if you believe now and into the future it's going to be less than a hundred rows, write the write the concise code. Probably that's even right here. a thousand. I mean, it, the Oracle database, man, it's it's pretty <laughs> powerful. But yeah, and certainly, and a part of it can also be write your code in the simplest, most straightforward, maintainable way. Yeah. Then do your testing and do your your you know stress testing of your application and see if you can find some blocks. And if you find a block in code with this, then you go in and spend the time and the resources and you know pay the price. Uh, yeah. But I would say if you're not sure and you're not already conversing with using for all in bulk collect, you don't want to do it unless you know you're going to need it. Right. Okay. <clears throat> all so right. There is one um, that I happen to know is in here that I want to make sure that we do get to. Okay. Um, and so I know somebody's going to give us the hook at some point. So maybe I'm going to direct us to, um, th there's a place, and, and this is something that I definitely learned from you, is around dynamic SQL. Um, I have been uh, a real, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, really against dynamic SQL, um, generally speaking. Um, but I've learned from you that, that I should embrace it more. Well, I think you need to use it judiciously. In general, the I think the situation with dynamic SQL and dynamic PL SQL, which we're actually going to see is, yeah. you only use it when you need to use it. And there are two needs. One is that I don't have all the information I need at compile time to write my statement, SQL or PL SQL. I have to wait till runtime. Then I have to use execute immediate to construct it and execute it. The overhead of doing that, don't worry about it. It's the complexity of code primarily and open possible vectors for SQL injection. The other major use case that I see is you can drastically reduce code volume, complexity, and, and improve maintainability over time. And that's the example we'll look at here. And that, then it becomes literally a, a question of the trade-off. And I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Do you get enough value out of the contraction of code, but the additional complexity to, to warrant it? So this is the I think this is the code you're talking about, right? It is. And, and I'm going to reiterate the point you made that, that it's not it's not really a performance issue to use um, dynamic field SQL. You can, you can expect it's essentially the same performance. Right, there's very little overhead. Right. Generally speaking, the action you're taking will be more, way more expensive than the overhead of making it dynamic. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, the code I saw. Wow, that's really great. Now I know you probably did it when you generated it, you copy pasted. It probably wasn't hard to build, but of course, what if I need to another, need to add another attribute? What if things change? What if somebody has to come and maintain it? And you know, it just the code volume was extraordinary. Just look at all these. It is. So, yeah. so I decided, can we do it dynamically? Now it's eleven thirty-eight. I want to talk about error handling. Um, so let's just, I guess, I'll quickly show the 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 change I made here, and just to give you a sense of the kind of difference. So the first of all, as you're looking at anybody's code and cleaning yourself, look for, to me, the big, the big takeaway was immediately this pattern of declarations. Whenever you see a long, long list of declarations, whether they're patterned names or not, there's a good chance that you need to make a number of changes to your code. And I won't get into all the possible changes, uh, but that's what caught my eye. And here's what I changed it to. Here's the post authentication procedure I've created a table. So I'm using a table. I'm using a DBMS SQL predefined string tables instead of all these declarations. And then I went through and looked all the places where changes were being made, and I changed them to dynamic SQL. Dynamic, yeah, this is SQL here. Now, so here's dynamic SQL. Here's dynamic PL SQL, both of them. So instead of having all of these assignments like this, this is a PL SQL statement. So what I did was change that as well here. So now I'm basically executing each one as a separate block of code, passing the variable name, constructing that attribute name on the fly again. Yes, it's a pattern. And then I can do this in the single loop. So all that code replaced by the single loop. Right, now, I so, wasn't able to make it, sorry, go ahead. So you've probably reduced it by the, the, this code itself by a factor of um, you know 10. You know, a tenth as many lines of code, I would guess. I'd have gotten rid of 100 lines of code. Yeah. 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 And I think that we weren't able to get rid of everything. So here's, I won't go into, again, all the details of it. Uh, here's my, here's another dynamic PL SQL block. 
but there was also, I think in this other one here, yes. So here's the only, the only way that it fell down is that when I was doing the execute of the update, I have to bind in the values of the attributes. And so this, in this case, we're still listing them out explicitly. I'm sure we could find a way to get around that, but at least in my first pass that remained. Right, and what I'll say on that is um, there might be in this case, a sort of a knee jerk reaction to build all of these as um, values that, that are concatenated onto the, the execute immediate, but then you really do run into the possibility of SQL injection. I think right. if you're gonna use execute immediate, what you've written here, there's just absolutely zero possibility of SQL injection because you're not concatenating on anything that could do that. You're using a using clause, absolutely the right approach. Um, my big, my two big things about not using dynamic PL SQL, SQL was um, performance, which I've been completely disavowed of, uh, but also the opportunity for SQL injection, but this does not have that. So. And again, remember folks, with SQL injection, big issue, you need to be aware of it, but it all has to do with allowing a user from the outside to inject their text directly into your statement without you getting in between the two. And so as long as you're you know, creating some kind of barrier, in this case, it's entirely internal, you don't have to worry so much about SQL injection. Okay, um, there was another case expression I wanted to show you that was more substantive, but I think given our time, I wanna go right to the end of this package. Yes. So let's talk about error handling because of course that's always a big deal in anybody's programs. And I think you did an okay job, but you could have done a better job. So first of all, we've got an when others, we've got an error logging utility. And interestingly, what, what Anton has done here is use Apex debug, which is an API provided by Oracle and Apex. It basically inserts into a table that you can retrieve from the Apex debug messages view. And he basically says, okay, I'm gonna log the fact that the error occurred, I'm gonna pass in the SQL error message, and then I'll re-raise the exception. All of that is good, but it could be a lot better in the following ways. First of all, if you have to provide SQL error message over and over again, whenever you're logging the error, that's a problem because that's something that could be done for you automatically. If you had a generic routine that would do it for you. Also, SQL error message is simply not sufficient. Years and years ago, when Anton first started using Oracle, maybe that would have been okay, but times have changed. So let's go up to the top here. What you really wanna do, first of all, is use something like the logger utility. Open source utility, it's been out there for years. It's really very, very robust. What you might also consider in something we're looking at at Insum is using and building on top of Apex debug, our own little kind of logger utility because it's built into Apex. Why not use Apex as much as you possibly can? But and I'll point is, out, you don't have to, you don't actually have to be in the context of an Apex application to use Apex debug. You can, you can use it throughout your code. Okay. But I will say, Anton, that really probably should only use it if you're an Apex developer, because among other things, then it's like, what the heck is that? Uh, agreed. Agreed. Um, there, and, and there are challenges if you're not within the context of right. an Apex application. In this particular case, this will always run inside an Apex application. Being an authorization utility for Apex. Yes. Right. So now what I've done is put into a single log error procedure, the call to Apex debug error. But what I've also done is called format error stack, which is the modern replacement for SQL error message. And more importantly, format error backtrace that traces back to the line in which the error was raised. Now, if you, use, if you were using logger, I think it's log error. You wouldn't even have to call these things. That's done for you by the utility automatically but it's not hard for you to build a very simple layer on top of whatever you're doing. And then this would simply be log error. Well, I gotta say unexpected error as a message is just not exciting. But anyway, that's what it would be. So you hide all the details. Where's the information going? How's it being logged? What's being called? It gets call stack and format error stack and format error backtrace done, all right? So I'd say one of the most important takeaways of any code review I've ever done is you've got to have a generic error logging process in place. Yeah, and I think that that um, your your mention of logger is a, uh, a great a great one. If you're not using anything right now, Logger or Apex Debug um, are two great options um, for, for, for those. And if you, 
And if you want something simple and fast you can put into place and you can't get necessarily approval for an open source utility in your code base, if you go to LifeSQL and search for error logging, I created a very simple bare bones package that will let you log errors, do what I just said, trap all that basic information, put it into a simple error logging table, and that'll be good for 99% of what you need anyway. So you don't have to get into a full blown utility even, and you can get somewhere good. Steven, uh, Anton, we, we really need to uh, move on to some of, some of the questions. Some of the questions, uh, are, we're losing some of the context uh, for some Let's of the do it. I did have a question for you though. When it comes to refactoring and going through, you know, looking, looking at your code, at your existing code base, do you recommend, Stephen, kind of syncing that up with database releases or do you say every so many months, every so many years, you're gonna take a look at your code? What do you, what do you recommend there? Because we we fall into this trap of if it if it's not if it's working you know we don't go back and 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 look I think at it. Generally, that's a really good position to take. If it's working, if it's not causing problems, yeah, don't. I mean, I don't know about any of you folks, but one of the best things about moving to a new job <laughs> is leaving all that code behind. <laughs> My having said that, you know, I used to joke with people that you know if you want to if you want to get motivated to um, to maintain your code or if you're worried about your children, this way I put it, if you're worried about your child growing up and someday ma maintaining your own code, either put a fake name in your code or write good code. Well, guess who's maintaining my dev gym code at Oracle now? Eli Feuerstein, but he's pretty happy. So I guess I did okay. Um, so no, the bottom line is if it's working, I think you should leave it alone for sure. But there's been so many great enhancements to the language. Okay. And we're dealing, some, in some cases, we're dealing with systems that are decades old. But and so, so what? If the user is not complaining, if the user is not complaining, why would you go in and fuss with something? Well, I asked you a question. Uh, yeah, I said, "What's the what's the, the the feature that you think is underutilized?" And you immediately immediately said collections. You said, "I think that you know that there's there's opportunities to use collections mm -hmm. that developers uh, aren't doing in too many cases." So when it comes to so you're saying if it's performing adequately, maybe they're not, maybe you know. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're if you're looking at if you're looking at uh, big dollars to upgrade to a higher performance, uh, either machine or or um, cloud service, then absolutely go back and take a look at what's what's running slowly, what's what's taking my computing power, and you're going to have an opportunity to save money um, by by rewriting code instead of purchasing more computing power, but. If everything's running fine and you're you're running at below fifty percent capacity, spend your money on new features. Now, having said that, I think having a culture in place in your dev organization that says every every month I'm going to pick it'll rotate through the team. One person will be allowed ten hours a month, and they can just look at whatever code they want, turn it on with compile time warnings, take a search through, use DB Code Cop, which is a utility from Travatus and Philip Salvesberg that I. I'm just getting my head around using that will automatically analyze code for conformance with Travatus guidelines. Number of tools you can use. I think that's a fine thing to build into your culture. Always look for opportunities. Uh, but And I think a part of that is primarily also building up the team and building up the knowledge of the team about the domains of their application. So I'm not saying there aren't good reasons to do it. But in general, if a piece of software is doing its job, let it keep doing its job. Noted. Noted. We do have that, some. Uh, we have some questions. Like I said, I think we. I think we've lost the some of the context or, because these were comments and questions that people were were mm -hmm. passing uh, or posting during the discussion. So, uh, how, Michelle, after after the webinar, can can we have Stephen and, and Anton look at these questions and well, and, uh, and post I mean, answers I think, there? I think I can, the last two. The last two that I see in the list are are pretty. Um, you know, we, we can we can address those. Maybe starting at the bottom, Stephen. The, there was one about um, the variable will be passed as a parameter. Can you pass the parameter as a variable in Dynamic SQL? I the 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 answer is the using clause mm -hmm. is static. Your your the variables that you have in your using clause of an execute immediate need to match the variables that are in the statement. The number of them. Um, I think that's the, the real thing. Um, so it's, it's a little bit unclear what the question is, but if you're looking for, if you want to have a, a dynamic list of parameters that are being passed in, of course, PL SQL doesn't support dynamic parameter lists for any, except from some of their built code. 
But the only way you can do that, you can do it with dynamic C PL SQL. You would literally construct the entire block. You wouldn't use the using clause. That's how you can do method for dynamic SQL with execute immediate. It's right. more complex. It's more open to challenges around implicit conversion of values for the parameters, number of things. But if, if the question is, can I make my parameter list dynamic when I use dynamic PL SQL? Yeah, sure. But the other thing, the other challenge there, like, I just want to say is you have to, you do have to be careful about SQL injection in a way that you might not otherwise be. Um, no, no, you should always use the using clause when you can. Yeah. But if you have some really extreme, well, first of all, if you have some really extreme dynamic requirements, then probably what you want to do is switch to DBMS SQL, which is the old horse, the old workhorse for dynamic SQL. And that will allow you to do method for dynamic SQL. We don't have time to go into all the details of it. Right. More, more naturally, as natural as dynamic SQL method for can get. And then I see another question. What about issues with errors with bulk collect where an error array sometimes is missing the errors? Again, a little bit hard to understand that question, but I think you might be talking about the for all statement with save exceptions. And that will trap all the exceptions that occur when you're trying the different bind variables with your statements over and over again. And it's true that there is some lack of error information that you can lose some error information that you would not lose with row by row DML, but usually it's not critical compared to the criticality of the improvement in performance you're getting or need for, to get from for all. Okay, so, there was one last question that you probably can't see because I messaged privately and said we'd ask you the question. So Hans, earlier when you were talking about the case expression and had your refactoring using case expression asked whether instead of using select count star, you could use select any value ID. Oh, huh. I don't, I'm not familiar with any value. Okay. Yeah, neither Monty and I- I'm not sure. Too. Okay. All right. I don't, we'll I'm not sure if that's, if that. I think that will basically do a sampling and return something from a group. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that would be a good substitute for. Is there at least one? I don't know. But it'd be good to explore. And I think there's. An, I see another question. What's your take on solving memory leaks that are issued in PL SQL code? Like memory leaks in PL SQL code. What do you mean? I think compared to other languages like <clears throat> C, memory leaks are not really a thing in the database PL SQL world. Um, and also PL SQL is a very mature, burned in language. So Chances are, I mean, they're used. To, I can remember open cursors is the only thing that I can think of is not closing cursors. Yeah, yeah. I, I can remember a long time ago when there was an issue with collections. When you had sparse collections, it would consume enormous amounts of memory. It would literally, if you had a row one and row one million, it would like use memory for one through a million. But those kinds of like things are pretty well knocked out. So a shukla, I don't know if you have a specific memory leak issue, but the main thing to do is if you can identify what you believe is a memory leak you go to Oracle support and log the issue because that's definitely a bug and they will work on getting it addressed. Um, but in general, I think that, you know, there are many, many, many advantages to writing PL SQL in the database. And one of them is having this very stable, robust, burned in through literally millions of production hours of intense usage. So not that it doesn't have bugs, but hopefully you won't see a lot on the memory leak area. But gentlemen, I think we've uh, I think we've accomplished uh, what we wanted to accomplish in the, in the time allotted. Uh, we Anton is chastised. Yes, we have accomplished our <laughs> objective. <laughs> so, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Anton. And, and I hope I hope you all in attendance found this to be interesting and can can really see the value of of having someone of uh, Stephen's caliber come in and work directly directly with you and your team. And I will not make fun of any of your code. I only make fun of my own code. And there's a lot um, to make fun of. Yeah, like uh, when when Hayden uh, made fun of my code on a recent instant tips, I say that's not normally how we do things at Insum, but no, um. we have to focus on. <laughs> no, I, I think it's important to to note that Stephen's working with your code. I mean, it's not an imp and depth world. I mean, yeah. this is a very unique opportunity uh, that we're offering. And in fact, if you're interested in signing up, this is this is a service we provide. We're offering it. Uh, for $2,000 US, and that is a fantastic price point. 
And actually, Monty, we agreed that for the first five companies that sign up, we're actually going to provide a 25% discount. So that's a savings of $500. I promise, Stephen, this is the first and the last time we will I haven't worked that sheet for you. years. Oh my. We will never discount you that much again. No, no, it's fine. I just have fun looking at people's code. Bring it on. That's there great. you go. For all the people I mean, that took time out of their busy days to join us today, we appreciate yeah. it. Well, how, how do they sign up, Michelle? Um, good question here. Let me share my screen quickly. Um, where is the, oh, just a second. While you're looking, I'm going to just say, uh, I've done this with Stephen many times and uh, it's always an enjoyable collaboration. And I think the collaboration is the, the term that makes it really mm -hmm. valuable. Um, you don't just get a, a report back, you get the opportunity to to, to talk about the, the topics and, and get a full understanding of, of this, as well as some guidelines that, that you can apply, not just to the, the code that you're looking at right now, but guidelines to all of the code you, you do in the future. So. So I just wanted to highlight that the URL is there. Um, this is where you go to. We'll also um, send you some emails with some information about it. So on that page, um, Sorry, I'm having trouble with my PowerPoint today. So over here, there's, there's a section to sign up. So just put your information there. We'll be in touch to schedule your session. And like we said, the first five will get that special discount. Again, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Anton. Thank you all for attending. Uh, remember, if your needs exceed your internal Apex bandwidth, please reach out to us. Thanks again for everyone uh, participating and have a wonderful yeah. rest of your day. Thanks all. Stay safe, Thanks stay healthy, everybody. stay masked, get stay vaccinated. <laughs> Bye. Bye everyone.